introduction, and also I would like to thank the workshop organizers for giving the, giving me the opportunity to speak here. So uh, from uh, several talks, we have already heard about some very uh, exciting new progresses in terms of cooling and controlling cold molecules, as well as their applications for quantum chemistry, uh, precision measurement, and so on. Here, I would like to discuss some uh, prospects from a many body perspective. So uh, using polar molecules for quantum simulation has drawn a lot of research interest in the past. Compared to other candidate platforms, polar molecules as a quantum simulator stand out due to several very nice features, such as the very strong intuition intrinsic to the systems, which allows for studying many body physics and also for efficient quantum control. And also, they, are, they have very rich internal levels, rotational, vibrational, hyperfine uh, levels. And this also allows for flexible engineering of various quantum models. And so here is a plot taken from a previous review paper which shows um, basically a landscape of using polar molecules for simulating quantum magnetism and lattices. And as you can see, in the pursuit of uh, all these applications, a lot of effort in the past has been made to increase the beam fraction and also uh, over the con better control of the different uh, um, compl complicated molecular structure. A demonstration uh, for quantum simulation purposes has been shown and several years ago in an experiment done in JIRA using KRP molecules, which basically it was effective spin one half system and with relatively low fitting fraction. That's basically relatively this part of this landscape. Apart from that, most part of this landscape has remained uh, unexplored experimentally. And it is also interesting to note in this figure that on the very right side part, there is this prospect for emulating magnetic dipoles using polar molecules where we need to use a, a more complicated level structure. So the key ingredient for all these applications, as we all know, is the um, strong dipolar interaction enabled by the large electric dipole moment of the polar molecules. And so for typical experimental conditions, uh, the lattice spacing allows for um, energy scale on the order of several kilohertz. So in the case of magnetic dipoles, basically we have a similar form of the dipole interaction, except that now we have uh, the uh, magnetic dipole moment instead of the electric dipole moment. The ma magnetic dipole moment is roughly proportional to the total angular momentum of the atom. And so despite the fact that, uh, uh, generally speaking, the magnitude. Okay. Sorry about that. Well, so um, despite the fact that, generally speaking, the magnitude of uh, the um, magnetic dipole interaction is much smaller than the electric dipole interaction. However, there are still several atomic species which allows for a considerable uh, energy interaction energy scale, such as the chromium and the erbium. And uh, especially in the past, there has been several experiments demonstrating the successful cooling down this, uh, this, this atom species into quantum generacy. So in this talk, I would like to present you some recent findings that we made by studying some of uh, these two experiments for chromium and the urban atoms, respectively. So both of those two atom species, they have a large total angular momentum. For example, for the chromium, the ground state involves a total angular momentum of three, which allows for seven different Zeeman levels. And for the case of the fermionic species or urban atoms, uh, we have an extra nuclear spin, which doesn't really contribute to a stronger magnetic dipole interaction. However, it does give rise to enriched in a Zeeman level structure, which involves 20 different Zeeman levels. And in the experiment, typically what they do is that they have a sufficiently large magnetic field. And this means that in the double interactions, the total magnetization, non-conserving term is forbidden. And so now we have a, a relatively simplified double interaction form. And both of these experiments, they are done in 3D lattices. The typical lattice spacing allows for uh, the bare double interaction on the order of uh, 3 hertz and 0 0.3 hertz for chromium and urban, respectively. <laughs> and also, we are in the region of uh, relatively high feeding fraction for both of these species. 
So essentially, what we have is a long range uh, interacting many body XXZ model. And the typical uh, readout procedure experiment is uh, most conveniently done by measuring the spin population on the different Zeeman levels. And this can be done by doing, simply doing the stern galak uh, separation. So with all this experimental uh, capability, and essentially what we want to uh, answer are particular this several questions, such as how does the double interaction manifest in the spin dynamics, and also how important is the effect of quantum, com quantum com uh, correlations. And uh, finally, and uh, do we gain anything now that we have actually a larger spin? So first of all, I would like to describe a little bit the theoretical approach that will be used to study the quantum many physics in such systems. We would like to have an efficient numerical approach. This is because with such an approach, then we will be able to verify that the, the dynamics we observed from the experiment is really a result from the desired many-body Hamiltonian. And also with such approach, then we will be also be able to characterize how much content coherence that we have in the experimental system. And we may even go one step further to identify the importance of the uh, content is such that we may actually be able to use the experimental system for doing some uh, task where the classical, com classical simulation is impossible. However, as we all know, it's generally very difficult task to solve a quantum many body problem. This is because of the increasingly large Hilbert space with the system size. In our case, we have actually a large spin S, and this means that we have uh, even larger local Hilbert space, so that the total Hilbert space of the many body system increases even faster. And on top of that, because we want to study the many body physics, that also means that if we want to use some simple method such as exact diagonalization that will be simply inefficient. An experiment, typically, the particle number is only order of tens of thousands. And also, because in the experiment, there is also this three dimension. And in principle, the long range character of the double interactions also allows for uh, a significant growth of entanglement. And this also means that uh, the matrix product uh, state based methods are also non applicable here. So the method that we actually use is based on phase space approach. So probably uh, many of you are familiar already with this approach. This approach has already been applied for studying molecular, molecular collisions decades ago. And here we want to apply it for many body setup. So essentially, the key idea of the phase space approach consists of the following procedures. First, we want to map our quantum Hilbert space to a phase space. For example, in quantum mechanically, what we have is um, a wave packet. And in the phase space, we can simply describe it in terms of like the two variables, x and p. And that also means that in the quantum operator, such as the x and p in the quantum mechanics now can be simply mapped into two real numbers in the phase space. And then because, as we know, that in the quantum mechanics, there is this uncertainty, uh, uncertainty relation. And so this can also be mapped into the phase space in terms of the initial distribution of the phase space variables. So then in order to obtain the uh, quantum dynamics, we can simply, by solving the uh, classical trajectory from each of this initial phase, phase point, and then we do a st statistical average over all these classical trajectories. So this method, the convention is called the truncated weak approximation, or TWA. And uh, however, for our case, for the spin system, it is not, uh, uh, it doesn't work very well. So we need to improve it a little bit. So this is what we actually do. And so as we know that for our case, what do we have with the spin S system? This means that for describing local density matrix, we actually need n square equals uh, 2 plus 1 square different elements. And so that means in the phase space, what we do to represent the local density matrix as a, actually we can just use a generalized gamma matrices. And so despite the, like all this a very messy mathematical form, but basically what you need to know is basically just that they are the generators of the SUM group. And so now in the phase space, each spin is basically described by a generalized Broca vector of D dimensions. And then we just do as a conventional TWA, that is we just map to the phase space. And so to show you some idea of how this mapping is done, I will give you several examples. First of all, so for example, for the spin one-half system, and then the uh, 
the gamma matrix in this case actually is just spin one half angular momentum operators. And uh, in the phase space, they can simply be described by the projection along the three different dimensions on a block, block sphere. And for a spin one case, and then slightly non-trivial, now we actually we need eight different uh, uh, components of the generalized block vector. And so now, for example, in order to describe initial state in M equals one, and then we basically, we in the, the phase space representation is in terms of all the possible values can be taken by these eight different components of the generalized block vectors. And then in the end, what we do is similar to the conven conventional TWA approach, then we just, uh, Basically, we can solve for the classical dynamics for, for each of the generalized block vector, and then we can do a statistical average. It is also uh, worth to point out that despite the similar uh, simplicity of this method, it's actually capable of capturing the quantum correlations. This involves both the interspin correlation and the interspin correlation. So with the theoretical approach at hand, now we would like to apply it to study some real experiment systems. So the major part of our system is described by the Doppler interaction. As we know for a spin one half system, if we prepare all the atoms in the same Zeeman state, the Doppler exchange doesn't give rise to any uh, population dynamics because this is the eigenstate of, the, of the time etonium. However, the situation is different if now we have a, a larger spin system. And why is that, for example, if we just think of the double is strange, even though if all the atoms they are initially in the same Zeeman state, and one atom, they can, they can go up one Zeeman level, while the other can go down one Zeeman level. And as a result, we will be able to see um, population dynamics. And basically, this result in a redistribution of the population along a synthetic dimension expanded by the Zeeman levels. As you already can see from this correlated nature of these hoping processes, this means that the quantum correlations can be generated during the spin dynamics. So this can be probed very easily in the experiment in such a procedure. So basically, you can just first prepare the atoms in the lowest uh, uh, ground, the ground state of m equals minus 19 half, and then you can use some uh, rabbit, some <laughs> RF powers to uh, prepare the, to transfer the population into another MF state. And then you can just let the system to evolve under the double interaction. And after some time, we can measure the population distribution of different Zeeman levels. So here shows the comparison between experiment, actual experiment measurement using urban atoms and the simulation result using the GDWA method that I just uh, described. So you can see there is a qualitatively, these two shows a very similar uh, propagation along the synthetic dimension. We can also uh, study the spin dynamics in a more quantitative way. So as you can see, so this figure plots the population on the two, the, the three mostly populated Zeeman levels. The symbols are the experimental measurement, and it nicely agrees with the theoretical prediction coming from the, uh, the dipolar exchange interactions. And in addition, the experiment measure the magnetization is also constant. That is consistent with the fact that the double exchange Hamiltonian does not change the total magnetization. In contrast, if we do not have a quantum correlation in our system, this is what happens. And actually what we see is that there is a much slower dynamics and also the dynamics will be very sensitive to the initial conditions. For example, if initially we have all the populations that can be perfectly transferred to a single Zeeman level, then what we see will be that there is a basically just a no population dynamics. And this can be understood in a very simple and intuitive way. This is basically because in the classical, if we have the classical dipoles and then the dipole exchange is nothing but this uh, spin projection. And in this case, the initial state we have gives you a zero projection along transverse direction. So that means there is no effect from the double strange interaction. So that means what we observed in experiment indeed is a quantum dynamics that come from the quantum correlations between the different atoms. And in addition, then what we can see here is that if we have only a nearest neighbor interaction, we also find a qualitatively different behavior between the numerical simulation and the experimental observation. And so this shows that the long range character of the double interaction significantly affect the uh, long time dynamics observed in experiment. 
given the fact that we have uh, 20 different Zeeman levels that also provide us with the uh, additional control knob. So basically, we can s initialize our spin uh, system in different uh, Zeeman levels and then let the system evolve to watch the dyna spin dynamics. So uh, now you see, apart from the fact that we all see a very nice agreement between our numerical approach and uh, the experiment observations, and so actually there is also a nice fact. So despite that all this fact, all this dynamics seems very different, but their uh, shorter dy dy dynamics, they all show a quadratic decay with time. And as a result, we can extract the initial decay rate. And so this shows the experimental result of this decay rate. And it shows that actually dynamics is faster when you initialize the, uh, the spins in the um, Zeeman state that's close to zero. And also, if we use this initial decay rate as some uh, time scale to rescale our, our time axis, what we find is that all these different spin dynamics collapse onto, uh, onto a single one at a short time. And the fact that this, all these dynamics that collapse together also imply that it is independent of the uh, inhomogeneous external magnetic field that is inevitably, inevitably present in the experiment. So the fact that there is this such independence of the external magnetic field may seem surprising at first sight. However, it can also be understood in a very intuitive way. So basically, we have this type of exchange process. If we consider a second order perturbation theory, then what we can find is that the, the initial dynamic is simply determined by the such a matrix element. And this matrix element will simply give rise to an initial rate, an analytic form of the initial rate. And so this tells you that the initial dynamics is, can be described by an effective interaction that is averaged over all the different pair of uh, dipoles. And also, there is an extra factor that's dependent on the initial state. So we plot this analytical prediction and compared it with the experimental result, and we find a very nice agreement. So this also demonstrates the fact that what the experiment observed is the feature from the dipolar exchange interactions. In the last few minutes, I would like to describe uh, another uh, experiment where we can study summarization in an ensemble of chromium atoms. So uh, we have a large spin system, and we have multiple Zeeman levels. It turns out that we can also use the population on different Zeeman levels as a probe of summarization. We have uh, this Hamiltonian, which is long-range interacting, and also the experimental system is three-dimensional. And this means that generally we can expect that at the long time the summarization will happen. And by this, then, what we mean is that the long-time population on different Zeeman levels can be simply described by an effective, effective thermal distribution. And apart from that, we have uh, only two constraints to conserve the quantities, that's basically the energy and the magnetization. And with these two, then that will help us to determine the, the exact form of the thermal distribution. And with that obtained, then we can also analytically predict what is the long time population of different Zeeman state. So this experiment is done with the chromium atoms. And basically, what they do is similar to the urban experiment. That is, we can quench our initial state to some uh, spin coherent state with a tipping angle theta. And then we let the system evolve for a certain amount of time under the double interactions. And then we measure the populations on the different Zeeman levels. And so as you can see here, so here the symbols that are the experimental measurements of the population at a very long time. And uh, we have uh, this solid line that is the numerical simulation that obtained for a very long time. And also, we have the dashed line, which shows the analytical prediction obtained from the thermal distribution. And you can see that all the three results, they agree nicely with each other. Not only confirms that, indeed, the experimental system summarized to the expected thermal, thermal prediction. And also, the fact that the GDDWA method is capable even for capturing such long-term behavior. And it's also very interesting to look at how the system approach to summarization. So this shows a full trajectory of the spin dynamics from the short time until the long time where they reach a uh, summarization. And the dash line shows the classical dynamics. So as you can see, well, the case for this quantum correlation uh, 
will be used uh, GTWA. So you can see very fast summarization to steady state. Uh, however, for the classical dynamics, we see a qualitative, qualitative difference in the sense that we still see a large oscillation. And this actually can, can be understood from the fact that classically, basically under the double interaction, each single spin, each single spin basically precedes in an effective field caused by other dipoles. And as a result, this dynamics never damps. It basically come from like the average over all different precession rate of the single dipoles. However, quantum mechanically, the summarizations happens differently. And because during the spin interactions, what happens is that the different dipoles they can also be correlated together. As a result, if we start from some product state at the beginning, and then because of the build of the quantum correlations, and each single spin density matrix will become mixed state. And so here, we can do this by looking at the single particle density matrix from our numerical simulations. And this product shows the magnitude of the density matrix elements for a single spin for different tipping angles and at the different times. As you can see, for example, for a tipping angle of 0 0.5, and because we have uh, initially a spin coherent state, we have uh, a lot of populations for these off-diagonal off -diagonal elements. However, as time proceeds, because of the quantum correlations generated, and we see that only the diagonal part is uh, dominantly po populated, this also implies that now the system becomes a mixed state and because of the buildup of the entanglement. And numerically, what we can do is that we can just uh, calculate the second range entropy for a subsystem of a chosen spin. And this as you can see, this sorted lines, there are the numerical predictions. And for each different dipping angles, they all reach some a maximum allowed range entropy. Although this range entropy is uh, uh, not something that they can measure in experiment, but they can measure something that is approximately similar. Basically, we can neglect the off diagonal part of the uh, single particle density matrix. And this is some, this is the quantity that is measurable in experiments. And it gives actually an upper bound, as shown by this reddish line, the reddish line here, that gives an upper bound of the actual range entropy generated by the, uh, during the dynamics. And this plot shows the comparison between the ex experiment result and the, the numerical simulations. The fact that we do see there is agreement between the numerical simulation and uh, the experiment, and as well as the fact that we see an increase of the diagonal entropy, this supports the uh, conjecture that we have uh, a lot of entanglements built up during the spin dynamics. So to conclude, uh, I will show you two experiment demonstrations as a quantum simulation of XXZ quantum magnetism. And so far, what we have done is to probe the features of uh, this XXZ model in terms of the spin populations. However, it will also be interesting to look at other measurable observables, such as the quantum spin coherence and also the spin-spin correlations. And also, I've already demonstrated to you that we have a numerical approach, and which is capable of accounting for not only the large internal degrees of freedom and also the larger system size, as well as the quantum correlations. This numerical approach can be uh, easily applied to other quantum spin systems, such as those for designed for polar molecules. And also, it can be generalized to study some other cases, such as a certain type of both Hubble model and the SU and spin models. And besides that, most of all the cases that we considered here is for lattice with a, a very high bidding fraction. And in the future, it also will be interesting to look at the spin dynamics where we have a sort of an intermediate amount of a disorder. And because for all the experiments that we uh, have already done here is actually using the magnetic dipoles. And as we know that, if we are able to use the polar molecules, and then the interaction energy scale is much stronger, this will also allow us to study something that is difficult to do with the magnetic dipoles, such as the interplay between this long-range double interaction and the motion. And because, as shown by some previous theoretical proposals, one can also use such as uh, symmetrical total molecules to simulate magnetic dipoles. And in that case, it will also be interesting to look at if we can find some similar features. Finally, I would like to thank my uh, collaborators 
And so the experiment I done in Francesca Polano's group for the urban atoms, and in Bruno Labuse Laura's group for uh, the chromium atoms. And with this, uh, I would also like to thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much. Any questions? One or two? How does all this dynamics depend on temperature? I mean, what are you assuming on temperature? So in this and case, what's going basically, down from, yeah. basically, we all have a, like, a zero temperature state. We have a, a in the spin sector, state. yes, but in the, <coughs> not in the, in the spin part, I understand, but in the density sector, or not. So, yeah, so, so we have a, dynamics should depend on the temperature. Yeah, we have a, like a, so for example, in the chromium case, We have a unit feeding lattice, and uh, the motion is basically uh, forbidden in this case. So what do we only need to right, consider? What about random holes in there? Yeah, exactly. That's uh, for chromium. There is no random holes. It's a unit feeding. Or However, for the... If that's your simulation, yes. The no, in experiment. In experiment, okay. what actually... Uh, that's actually a good question, but this uh, will involve some experiment details. Because like this are both on flight, and so what they can do is actually first they form a model insulin energy. Sure, but it's finite temperature, so there will be charge fluctuations. Yeah, that's right. And but basically what they have is that they can also just remove the part uh, where they have the double ones. Right, and then, yeah, and so still they have a wire logic system, and eventually those fluctuations that wait, you mentioned. Wait, wait, but when you remove the double ones, you still have holes, right? Then you have a lot of holes in there. No. No, the, no. So what I was trying to say was that actually you still have a large enough system, right? And so in principle, yes, as you said, there could be some random codes, and that may actually play some role. And however, that is also like where our simulation can come in. But theoretically, what we do is actually just use the, the unit theory, and then we can compare that with the experiment measurement, and then we don't find any deviation to show there is a significant effect from the codes. Well, that's because that's what I'm asking. How, how sensitive is this dynamic? It's not sensitive. It's yeah. not sensitive. It's not sensitive. So it's basically just next neighbor dynamics then? No. It's not uh, uh, nearest neighbor dynamics as we confirm that. But if it doesn't depend on the holes, if you can have many holes and you get the same thing. The, the point is that they don't have many holes there. right? And so if you have a, a no, high enough density. Wait, wait, wait. Sorry, so okay. maybe, maybe I'm too stupid to, uh, to understand your point. Uh, I mean, you, you're saying that the spin dynamics does not depend on the number of holes, the whole dynamics. If you have a lot of holes, then it will, it will be dependent on that. And so that is kind of a, like you can, so you can imagine basically uh, this make a naive, naive way of describing it, but it's like if you have some stretch hold of holes, right, and so then if you like the field of stretch hold, then you'll find something that's very sensitive to the number of holes that you have, because as you, exactly as you said, so uh, if you look at this simple theoretical prediction, the holes will also affect this average double interaction that you have. And this not only comes in to the shorthand dynamics, and that's predicted by this expression, but also the holes will also affect the, the long-term dynamics. And this is something that one can generally expect from this large difference between nearest neighbor Dynamics, yeah, I, guess, I guess what I'm asking, if, if we we'll we'll go back one slide where okay. I did many curves, instrumental curves also. Uh, this one, yeah. So if I would have a system which has, I don't know, 30% holes, mm -hmm. would the dynamics here look the same? It will not be the same. But not exactly, I understand. But uh, mm -hmm. I mean, will there be, I mean, okay. I guess I would like, I'd like to be more quantitative, but okay. Okay, so actually for this experiment, it's it with an urban, and we already have 30% of hole. And so then what but we This is the zero temperature calculation. So the experiment has 30% holes, and you're comparing to In my, In our simulations, we can, like, it's like uh, we, we can account for the final temperature. The, 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 line, the line is zero temperature. It's not, for this case, it's not. It's not a zero temperature case. It already accounts for holes. Yeah, I guess maybe uh, like uh, because I'm describing two ex different experiments, it may be a little bit confusing, but uh, it's kind of out. But how does the zero temperature, you for sure have done the zero temperature calculation, zero how does that look? Basically, you, you for, for example, for here, you basically look something like this. Okay, one more, no? 
turn off, off we go to the poster session. I thank all the speakers again.